All right, let's do this. So we're going to have a conversation about Bitcoin and the psychology of acceptance. There's a lot of common disciplines that are applied to the discussion of Bitcoin. So frequently people will speak about and analyze and conceptualize Bitcoin in terms of mathematics. That's probably at its core how it began and uh, the discipline of cryptography. And if you go a little bit further beyond those disciplines, people talk about Bitcoin in concepts of technology, economics, more generally, again, if we get into mainstream, uh, in terms of investing, some people take a discussion point focused on legal or regulatory issues. And then you can get into slightly more uh, esoteric uh, concepts and discussions, including philosophy, politics. But this particular presentation is focused on psychology. And interestingly, I would say most of the discussion around Bitcoin to date, uh, depending upon the group that you're in, but in the mainstream, it's primarily around the areas of technology, economics, uh, investing, and to some extent, regulatory issues. And then you get a few more specialized people who focus on more uh, technical or hardcore specific areas, including mathematics and cryptography, and then at the other end, uh, philosophy and psychology. So what and specifically about psychology is relevant to Bitcoin and how do we apply it? Well, basically, the market value of an asset such as Bitcoin, of any asset really, is ultimately determined by what people are prepared to pay for it. And what others are willing to pay is based on their desire to have it. Right? If there's a strong desire to have something, you or we collectively will pay more for it. And if there's no desire, we will pay less for it or nothing. Now, desire for something is ultimately a concept which is explained by psychology. And this is why in this presentation, we are going to discuss Bitcoin by applying certain principles of psychology. Before we do that, let's consider the distinction and difference between intrinsic value and extrinsic value and why psychology is so important to the latter. Intrinsic value is a definition that we give to something where its core fundamental value can be analyzed and mathematically calculated. So for example, if I have an apartment that is producing a particular return on investment and no one else has any interest in buying that apartment, that is really irrelevant to the income that it's producing. It will produce that income regardless of anyone wants to buy it or not. So intrinsic value is something that can inherently be calculated based on certain metrics such as the return that an asset can produce. And this is why value investors such as myself really focus primarily on intrinsic valuation of any investment that we make. Then there's the concept of extrinsic value. And this is really the value that is attributed to an asset over and above its intrinsic value. So if we look at a number of assets, a range of assets, there's no necessarily rational reason or calculatable reason why an asset should be worth something because these things don't produce a return. Gold is a great example in that regard. And you could put types of art into that uh, and other concepts as well. But really these, uh, these types of assets are entirely dependent on the collective total value of the desire divided by the um, amount of this particular asset or availability of that asset. In the case of Bitcoin, 
the extrinsic value depends entirely on the collective value of the total desire for that asset divided by the number of satoshis available. That is the entire equation that one needs to make, which ultimately determines the value of Bitcoin, both in the present, both in the past, and uh, into the future. So let's talk about the psychological struggle that goes on with all of us as individuals with regard to the contemplation uh, and acceptance of Bitcoin as something we might, might wish to uh, own. Why is it that we often see a hostile reaction from some when it comes to the discussion of Bitcoin? I've seen examples of people who express anger, annoyance, frustration, perhaps there's an element of fear, disbelief, you know, I, we could think of other descriptions here, but I think these various reactions will resonate with a lot of people, regardless of what your actual view of, of Bitcoin is. What I think is important to remember is that all of these reactions are very natural when any uh, in any kind of situation where a fundamental belief is being challenged. Let's get into the psychology of learning a particular conceptual framework and then we'll apply that over time to Bitcoin. Both humans um, and all other animals learn from infancy. And it's primarily a matter of learning through cause and effect. A child, for example, learns that when it cries, it will probably get attention in a number of ways. It may get picked up, it may get uh, given some food, or it could learn that maybe something adverse happens to it, such as that it, that it, that it gets hit. And these, uh, these reactions and consequences that flow from certain things all form part of a person's framework as they develop. As a child grows, for example, the child will quickly learn that if they fall down, that they will get hurt. They learn very quickly that if you drop something, it goes down rather than going up. They learn that certain things, when you drop them, may bounce a little bit before ultimately succumbing to gravity. And all animals have a degree of learning due to the fact that they have a brain. Mental frameworks that are developed when we are young uh, are very flexible, but as we age, they become more rigid. And this is very natural if you think about how people learn. Um, if you were a child and you were living in an environment where there was no gravity, you wouldn't think and become locked into thinking that if you were to drop something, it would inevitably go down. You would start thinking that if you were to drop something, it would just start floating. And you know there, there are many examples of how a person's environment forms a framework. If you're a child, and you're exposed to violence as the core solution to any kind of dispute, then that becomes part of your mental framework. And the, the more entrenched that that becomes, uh, the more exposed that you are to it, the more that becomes part of your thinking. And again, this is very important in terms of how we bring up children, how we, uh, how we treat animals that we want to work with or that we love, such as our pets. and whether or not it is a good or a bad thing that we become more rigid with age, I would say there are good evolutionary and logical reasons why we do come more fixed in our thinking as we age. There's a good reason why you can't teach an old dog new tricks in general. And, and that is because as a dog has learned to survive in the world as it understands it, or a person, there isn't often a need to learn new things. In fact, sometimes learning new things or changing your thinking 
has more downside than upside. But stick with me, I have an old dog and my dog actually still does learn new tricks and I think it's for his benefit. So let's, let's continue. Let me give you the example of the granny at the rave party. I'm not sure if people here have gone to a rave party before, but generally you'll see younger people at a rave party. And that's because the concept of a rave party and the music that goes with it, the substances that go with it, these were something that were created by a younger generation of people. But attendance to rave parties is not exclusive to people of that certain particular age demographic. And that's why at rave parties, you'll almost inevitably see, you know, the odd elderly person, if you like, dancing away. And this is an example of a person who has learnt new tricks, so to speak, despite the prior um, concepts that they formed in their mind and, um, and they've adapted. They've gone and they've adapted and are adopting something new. Okay, let me give you another example. This is the example of the grandfather and the birthday dinner. And this is a real, a real life example. I knew someone who tried to take out her father to a sushi restaurant. That was the intention. She said, granddad, I've got a surprise for you. I'm taking you out to sushi. And, and she thought she was doing something nice for him. Now he was quite a traditional elderly Australian and he immediately had an adverse reaction. Not, he said, I don't want pickles and, and raw fish and, and whatever else. All I want is meat, potatoes and veggies. That's what I want and that's where you'll take me. So here you have an example whereby she tried to expose her father to something new, but for good reason, he was very set in his ways. He lost the desire to try something new. Now, ironically, in this story, five years later, he actually did try sushi and he really enjoyed it, but it took a long time for him to change his, his mental mindset. Um, and that obviously led to a, a hostile reaction to the proposal that he try sushi. And as um, I've explained and we will discuss going forward, this is quite a natural reaction for people to have. Now let's apply the psychology of learning to investment. People inform investment concepts from a very young age. From the age of five, people may learn, for example, the concept of sacrificing something in the short term for longer term gain. They may learn, for example, that uh, having two of something is better than having one of something. And so the, the concepts start early and over time, these form a framework for how we approach concepts related to investing. And ultimately, the type of concepts that we adopt to help us assess risk versus reward. So there are many examples. Some people over time may come to the conclusion that there's, a, there's an optimum stock to bond ratio allocation. And, and you know, this may weigh well quite, work quite well for them and they may have good reasons for doing so. They may decide that they only want to stick to property. I've spoken to people who said, I'm never touching a stock again. I lost money. If you wanna say, if you wanna be secure, buy property. And you know, I suspect we've all come across people who've had a mindset like that. And there's good reason, probably historically, that explains why they've adopted that particular line of thinking and why they really believe it. Then there's the gold bugs. I suspect we've always come across people who are fanatical about gold, or it may be that they don't have, just have a strong view that you need to have some amount of gold in your portfolio. And again, they have good reasons for believing that, but even if they don't, it becomes very much a part of their investment framework. Another very important part of investing is perhaps you know some of the types of thinking that the person who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad espouses. And you know the need to always put some money aside, the need to constantly save, 
the need to spend less than what you are earning. These are very fundamental concepts to some people, but to others, they are very foreign. Most people will adopt a concept over time to avoid investments that look risky or that appear like scams. And again, and you know, we all we all learn these things from a young age. We learn to stay away from things that appear dangerous, whether it's a stranger in the street or whether it's a dangerous looking toy or an animal. Um, and we in general that keeps us safe and so there's a reinforcement of this type of self-protected behavior and it's no different in the area um, of investment and for some people but not others we start to really develop a more complex uh, mindset or framework in terms of how we assess investment and we start to look at things like price to book ratios, uh, return on equity, you know, price equity ratios, um, earnings per share growth. We look at the future cash flow of a particular investment and we discount and compare that back to the return on cash. I'm not saying we all do that or we uh, all do it in uh, an equal way, but in some way or another, we all do this and obviously some people do this better than others and uh, that is why some people are inherently better investors than others and why others always seem to be losing money or don't have any money at all. Let me tell you the story about the child who burns his finger. If you at a young age um, touch a flame and burn your finger or if you are like me at a young age you reach out and touch a cactus. I, I saw a fluffy cactus and I went to touch it and it really hurt. From that time on, once you've been burnt, so to speak, and in this case, it was literal or pricked, you will typically stay away from what burned you last time. And that will, in most cases, serve you well. And if someone was to try and convince you that it was actually a very good thing for you to put your hand into a flame, or to touch a cactus, you would take a lot of convincing uh, to have your historical frame of reference changed. Let me give you another personal ex example of rigid thinking. Uh, and this is my struggle or my learning perhaps as to how to value a tech company using traditional valuation metrics and assumptions. So for a long time, and even now to tell the truth, I, as a hardcore value investor, have stayed away from, I guess what you would call growth companies, tech companies. And that's primarily been because the price, er price earnings ratio has been so high that it hasn't fitted my metric of investing. In fact, sometimes there have been no earnings, which has made me uncomfortable as well. Um, and this is, as I explained earlier, a, an adaptive mechanism designed to prevent losses from occurring. Um, but in actual fact, what did happen is that it led me to fail to make gains. I didn't invest in Facebook or Google or Microsoft when they listed. And to quote Warren Buffett at the time, that Facebook listed, or maybe, maybe it was Google, I can't recall, I think it was Google, he didn't buy and he was quoted as saying, these could be great companies, but they come at a great price. That was pretty much my thinking. And, um, I, you know, there was also, this This wasn't really a particular concern to me, but year after year after year, I obviously missed out on the growth of those assets. And I could have been left bitter that I missed out I could have, you know, stubbornly year after year said these companies don't deserve their valuations or I could have opened my thinking and decided to think whether there is another rational way that I could personally be comfortable with that I could use to value uh, these types of stocks. And I came to the conclusion that there are some unique aspects to certain types of cloud based companies and that includes the ability for them to grow at very 
additional extra cost per user, um, the very high barriers to entry, the very low cost of sales, uh, and um, and and then I had to really decide which companies in light of that context and also the fact that maybe they aren't paying out any income, but they're reinvesting that into the company themselves, such as Amazon, um, which of those companies I think are a feasible investment. So perhaps I'm a conservative a person, but I've come around to accepting that Google and Microsoft at current price levels are okay investments and they're a better investment in my mind than cash. Um, I'm still far from accepting that a company with a valuation such as that of Tesla is a good investment. So, uh, you know, I've, I've modified my framework and I'm adapting that to ensure hopefully that I continue to thrive while also avoiding making mistakes. The key here is that flexibility in thinking is something that can help a person evolve in a positive and desirable way. And this applies in the investment context as well as in other areas of law, sorry, other areas. Um, now, how do humans react to a core belief being threatened and why do they react in this particular way? Well, when a person's confronted with something new, a new concept, something that's unfamiliar, novel, or perhaps something that's incongruous with an existing belief that they have, one thing they may do is simply ignore it. You know, if I if I see people adapt, adopt a new style of fashion, or a new mannerism, or a new way of talking, a new type of slang, one thing I might do is to simply choose to ignore it. I might sort of shake my head in disbelief, you know, at the fact that this new particular trend has just taken off. Maybe people have started eating some kind of unusual food, or they have um, started greeting each other in a particular way that I find very unusual. I'll, I'll just maybe shrug my shoulders, sort of be quite surprised, quite a, find it quite hard to believe, um, but you know, I won't really let it bother me. I may take some awareness in to what they are doing, but have no real intellectual interest in the rationale behind why they're doing it. I might observe curiosity and, and actually try and figure out intellectually what's going on, why people are doing these things, why something has changed to which I didn't uh, didn't fit into my prior style of thinking, but I still wouldn't adopt um, or accept these types of new things for myself. I might decide I want to cautiously explore. And so I might actually engage carefully in these new things that I've seen, or maybe ask people questions about them. And I might decide to actually get to the point where, hey, this is something I like and I would adopt it or embrace it. Okay, so this is something that happens in many, many different contexts. Um, it could be, for example, let, let's take a, an example here um, uh, of home computers. When, when home computers were developed, a lot of people thought that you know, they would be useless things and no one would use them. But over time, gradually, we've come to accept that computers will be used. And now we all have a home PC. And, you know, looking back, um, looking back, all those people who thought that we would never all have a computer in a home, let alone one computer each, let alone a computer that fits into um, one's hand, um, well, they've obviously all been proven wrong and they will admit that they were wrong. Same thing applied with the internet. You know, in the very early days of the internet, no one really very few people, I think, envisaged how ubiquitous it would become. And there were lots of reasons that people gave as to why, you know, it was a novelty that, that wouldn't um, grow in the way that some envisaged it would. Microwave ovens, again, who would have thought when they were first invented, first conceptualized, that they would be so widely adopted and, and included in people's homes? Self-driving cars is an interesting one. We all know people who say things like, I would never 
have a self-driving car. And again, the, the probably your older people, your grandfather, but there are quite rational reasons why people would be averse to the concept of self-driving cars. And then if we get to a younger demographic, we get to people who don't probably even ever plan on owning cars and who over time realize already that they will be hopping into self-driven cars um, that take them around the city. Homosexuality, attitudes, contexts, um, cultural shifts take place with regard to the acceptance of sexual trance. Gender equality is another one. Certain people of a certain age will be very fixed in the beliefs they have around the roles uh, of different types of genders. Um, and again, we're you know, probably more driven with a younger demographic in mind these concepts do change. Let's think about marijuana. If we go back to the, the, the prior slide that we were looking at, and we, we look at the concept of drug use, again, initially people may have a very adverse, hostile concept to the, uh, to the use of marijuana. They may believe it's a bad thing, an evil thing, and there'll be a whole range of reasons, probably historical and obviously historical reasons why they have such an adverse um, view to it. And over time, we've seen huge cultural shifts to the point where in some countries now, marijuana is entirely legalized. And the whole line of thinking has really changed both in terms of um, its potential dangers, how people react when using it, but also concepts around individual rights and freedoms. So these things do change and it's a very normal normal process for there to be objections as people and as society as a whole figures out and embraces or decides not to embrace new concepts. And Bitcoin is no different. So let's go over some of the common objections that we hear or that we hold ourselves uh, in relation to Bitcoin. And none of these will surprise you. Um, some of you may laugh at these, some of you may agree with them. Uh, and these are all things that I've heard. Unlike gold, you can't touch it. So therefore, Bitcoin uh, is, not, is not valuable. Gold has a history of 5,000 years. Bitcoin has a history of not much more than a decade. Therefore, Bitcoin is not good. You know, it's just a number in cyberspace. How many people have heard that? How can you trust something when you don't even know who created it? What if the internet goes down? It's not legal tender. It's the role of the government to determine what people use as a medium of exchange. People should not decide for themselves how they want to store value or exchange value. There'll be rivals to Bitcoins, we call them alts or shitcoins, that can easily be created. What's to stop a person creating an alternative to Bitcoin? It's too hard to use. I, I wouldn't know how to use it, where to buy it, where to store it. Too complicated for me. Now, these are all very, very rational things for anyone new to Bitcoin with an existing mindset to think about. And let's go on. Oh, it's too volatile. It was created by the CIA. China will create a better digital coin. It's used for illegal and anonymous transactions. It's not anonymous. This is uh, interesting too. People on the one hand will object that it's anonymous and used for something illegal. And then at the same time, there's another objection either from the same person at a later point in time or a different person who will object on the basis that it's not anonymous. What if I lose it? It can be confiscated. It relies on electrical energy and that is bad for the environment. How can I assure it can't be hacked? It's a Ponzi scheme. It doesn't meet the definition of a currency. Some of you who are more skilled in the area um, of debating or um, of philosophy will realize that some of these points are are quite ridiculous because really, for example, let's take this one. It doesn't meet the definition of a currency. A currency, <coughs> whether or not 
it meets a particular definition of a currency is really irrelevant as to whether or not it functions as it's supposed to or whether or not it's something worth investing in. But that's a side point. I, I, the main point here is that there are many objections that people can throw up um, and, uh, and uh, confront you and confront themselves with as they figure out how they want to approach Bitcoin. And all of these objections are determined and governed by a person's pre-existing framework. These these objections, by the way, are not, I, I don't want to say that everyone who has these objections are stupid or unintelligent or unthoughtful, quite the opposite. Very intelligent people can hold strong views or strong objections on certain things. There are, there are very intelligent people uh, who have a strong view um, in areas of religion or against homosexuality um, or um, around diet or around, um, you know, around the use of drugs. These are intelligent people and they are simply using their existing framework to come to the point at which they're at um, in terms of their uh, view on a particular topic at a particular point in time. Now, in psychology, we have a very useful model that we use when it comes to grief in particular, but it can be applied beyond grief. And this was a model that was conceived by a psychologist called Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And she set out in very simple terms, and it's more complicated than what I'm representing here, but a type of process that almost all people go through when confronted with a loss, or if you apply it more broadly, when confronted with something new. Because when you are confronted with something new, that in itself is a type of loss. It's a challenge to your existing way of thinking. So when you first come across something that confronts you as a loss, your initial reaction will be one of denial. You'll try and avoid it. You'll be confused. You'll be shocked. You'll be scared. Uh, and let, let's apply this to a person dying. Okay, you get a phone call. Your loved one has been killed in a car crash. This is the first typical stage that you'll go through. And, you know, these are not exactly stages that go in exact order. And you can also jump back and forth between them. But that may be your first reaction. Denial, confusion, shock. After that set in, you'll get to a phase of anger and there may be frustration and anxiety. Okay, who did this? How could it happen? Um, you want to find someone to blame. And this is a very natural reaction to have when confronted with something which is upsetting to you. Then there's a bargaining process. And bargaining can be in your own mind. It can be you having to think through, yes, okay, I'm really dying of cancer. I need to figure this out. I need to think about how I can go forward with this, or it could be bargaining with somebody else. Let's say you're in a relationship breakup. The bargaining phase here would be, please, please don't leave me. You know, is there anything I could change? What did I do wrong? Um, and so, or, you know, if you were being fired by your employer. So bargaining can be both external and internal. Then, there's typically a, a, a period of depression. Now, don't think about this necessarily in the psychological sense. It could be a, a better word could be sadness or a feeling of helplessness where you just resign yourself to the fact that you've got no choice in this, but that it's happening to you. Um, and then ultimately, once it's happened, you move into an acceptance phase. And this is where you realize that there is no alternative or that you've learned something new, uh, that your prior way of thinking was wrong, and you accept it and you move on. Okay, so this is a typical cycle. And again, there are good uh, biological and evolutionary reasons why humans, and to some extent animals too, even quite primitive animals, go through some uh, similarity 
uh, of a cycle such as this. So let's look at some examples of how we would apply the Kubler-Ross model. I've talked about death, you know, a divorce or a breakup. Let's take veganism. Let's say your mindset was one that from the very, you know, from very birth or from a very young age, you were given meat to eat as a child. Now you grew up in a meat and eating environment and you were then confronted with the concept of veganism. And someone tried to tell you that uh, eating meat is unhealthy for you or that by eating meat, you're causing harm to others uh, and that morally it's not a good thing to do. This is a real challenge to your prior way of thinking. And it's quite natural for people who have not grown up as vegans to take a very hostile stance to someone who tries to explain the concept of veganism to them. And, you know, just like all of the objections we saw to Bitcoin, there are a whole host of objections to veganism. And it might be things like, well, God created animals to be eaten, or animals don't actually feel any pain, or, um, well, they were bred to be eaten, so it's okay. Or, well, I've eaten animals so far all my life, so there's no reason to stop now. Or, you know, humans evolved to eat meat. That's why we have uh, sharp canine teeth. Um, or, um, you know, if you don't eat meat, you can't develop muscle. And, and on and on we go. And ultimately, we know that all of those, uh, those types of responses are incorrect and false. And the actual answer really is that I eat meat because I enjoy it. That's what it comes down to. Um, but it can be a very difficult process for a, a meat eater who has a discussion um, with a vegan over veganism to get to that level of acceptance. Let's take another one, the existence of God. If you've been brought up in a religious environment and your entire frame of reference has been about the Bible, and stories of the Bible and how you're going to go to hell if you if you do certain things and to heaven, if you do others, um, and I'm not picking on any particular religion, this, the, you know, these concepts apply to all religions, you may initially take a very hostile stance on someone who tries to explain to you that there is no God. And the reactions that you get from individuals or collectively when these types of uh, challenges are raised in a person's thought process can be extremely hostile. Okay, so let's now apply this model to Bitcoin. When people are confronted or were confronted with the Bitcoin as a concept, and remember, not everybody re read or is capable of reading or understanding Satoshi's original white paper yeah, the, 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 and it depends upon their individual background and the point in time at which they first became familiar with a bitcoin but the first response may typically be a, a denial type of response you know they ignore it they confine it to something that is of interest to geeks or nerds and and they'll just dismiss it it's no big deal i've, I've heard about this bitcoin thing but it's you know not something I'm interested in. I know computer geeks are into it. But there may also be uh, a period of time where they develop a level of anger or hostility, and the, you know the reaction is you know what's all this talk about Bitcoin? I'm sick of hearing about Bitcoin. Why are you trying to ram Bitcoin down my throat? Bitcoin's a cult. Um, you know your adoption of Bitcoin is putting my gold or my fiat currency, or my government, which I love, at risk. Um, and, and there might also be some degree of anger in the sense that a person may feel that they've missed out on something. You know, why didn't I invest in Bitcoin earlier? I think even any Bitcoin hater, except the most extreme, would accept that they wished that they had invested in Bitcoin earlier. So there are different reasons why people who don't have Bitcoin uh, uh, express certain traits that appear to be angry, angry or hostile. 
Then people get to the, the bargaining type point, and we often see this in pub debates and increasingly also over internet forums, where people put out these types of hostile responses with the hope that there will be a response to it, and then they consider that response and decide whether or not they want to make that response part of their framework. So we can probably all think of areas in our lives where uh, the way we figured things out is not just internally in our own heads, but externally by putting things out there. In business meetings that I'm in, when I try to uh, come to a decision, I often put a range of concepts out there for other people to shoot down, and I like that. And, and that helps me ultimately come to what I think is the, the best conclusion. I find it very helpful to, to hear counter arguments to views that I have. Um, now, the problem, of course, is that in pub debates, things can get heated with people yelling and screaming and alcohol involved. Um, in internet forums, again, things can get heated perhaps because people are operating in a slightly different environment um, or take discussions uh, personally. And so, but either way, this bargaining process takes place both externally and then internally. Internally, you might decide to do a lot of research on Bitcoin. You might decide you want to uh, look at Satoshi's white paper. You might want to think through in your own head what would really happen to each of these objections that you have and figure out whether or not they are rational objections to hold. Depression. Okay, sometimes people and this, these are particularly people who kind of realize that they're wrong or are close to realizing they're wrong. They pretty much imagine the child who you're trying to tell off, who stomps her feet, slams the door, sticks her fingers in her ears uh, and goes off into her room. Now they know they're wrong. They know they've done something naughty, um, but they don't want to accept it. And it's not just children, by the way. I, we can all, we've all seen it with adults, whether it's face to pay, face, um, or online uh, discussions where people get into this point where they uh, they just sort of pretty much shut themselves off. You know, they they hold their ears and they say, I don't want to talk about it anymore. That, you know, um, enough's enough. Um, and and we, we see this from authoritarian parents. Uh, sometimes, you know, I don't care what you're saying. This is this is my house and these are my rules. Um, and you know we, we see it in other types of uh, scenarios and again it's a very rational response or very understandable response i would say for a lot of people who who have difficulty separating emotion from logic and again i'm not saying this is in, in a bad way this is a very uh, very normal um, phenomenon in most humans we are emotional beings and if we were purely unemotional we become more robotic like and there are people like that um, and people might say that they are actually slightly uh, perhaps autistic um, is one word that has been used for some people who have a lack of emotion and think entirely rationally we then may go through an experimentation phase um, leading towards possible acceptance. Okay, if, let's take the the marijuana example. All these bad things that you've heard in your life. So you decide, hmm, okay, well, I, I will try this just once. Let's see. And you have a puff of some marijuana, and you decide it was a very enjoyable experience after all. Or, or maybe it was ecstasy, or maybe it was cocaine. Um, maybe it was a sexual experience that you had. Maybe it was a type of food that you tried, a vegetable um, that you never thought you would eat. And so you have a little taste. Uh, and before you know it, you have found yourself experimenting. You've been, quote unquote, open minded. And that's led to you accepting a, um, a new way of thinking. So. A typical example of a person who moves towards progression, progressing of accepting Bitcoin might be, okay, I admit that the US dollar, which I previously had faith in, is devaluing in purchasing power. So I admit with you on that, but why not buy property as an alternative? Why Bitcoin? Okay, so here you can see you've made 
or that person has made some progress in their understanding. They might say, okay, I accept, I admit, that Bitcoin is something that's limited in supply. I see the benefits in, in an asset that's entirely finite, but I've got no idea how to acquire it. Okay, so you, you can see here the the move uh, from uh, in the in the Kubler-Ross model um, and applying it to Bitcoin, how someone can progress on a journey towards acceptance, <coughs> and then ultimately you do see. Uh, at least for some people or all people who are Bitcoiners who obviously have reached the level of acceptance of adoption, they're using it, they may even decide to embrace it or become advocates. Um, and and so that this is the typical journey that we all go through when struggling uh, or being confronted with any challenge to our existing beliefs. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about the role of Bitcoiners as counselors. And by Bitcoiners, I'm referring to people who have gone through the journey and who have come to the conclusion, rightly or wrongly, because I, I don't want to this to be a discussion of right or wrong. I want it to be more around the psychology. But people have gone through the journey and have concluded that Bitcoin uh, is something that they want to adopt that has a future um, and you know all the things that go with it in terms of being the perfect form of money due to its qualities of infinite divisibility, immediate transferability, um, you know, uh, perfectly finite in supply, et cetera, et cetera, right? So if you are a Bitcoiner, you may find yourself in the role of a psychological counselor. And as psychologists, we apply different models to different situations, and in particular in the areas of grief or helping people confront new concepts, we do apply certain psychological principles. So this is what I'm going to get into now. The role of a counselor is to help a person along their own journey of acceptance. Okay, and this is important. Ultimately, you are there to help the person figure things out for themselves. You're not there to force them to do something. And this is really an important distinction to make and one that I think many Bitcoiners let themselves down on. And it's simply because they don't understand the, the concept of counseling. If you're a mathematician, if you're used to thinking about things in a logical or black and white way, you may not appreciate the softer skills involved in helping a person figure things out for themselves. It's very important to be patient. It's very hard to change a person's uh, mindset overnight. And for someone who's already made the journey, it's sometimes a natural inclination to find that other people who don't hold the same view as you are, are stupid or to label them stubborn um, or to simply take a hostile reaction towards them. But that is ultimately not going to be productive. You need to be patient. You need to be sympathetic. You need to understand as a counselor that a person's journey and thinking and emotion takes time. We apply this with children. We apply this with animals. We apply this in business negotiation. And we uh, apply it to, um, to the area of grief. Empathize. It, you know, one of the most powerful things you can do to align yourself with somebody is not to dismiss what they are saying outright or to make fun of them, but rather to empathize with their feelings. I can certainly empathize why someone might be worried that uh, that Bitcoin uh, that they have could be lost. I might, uh, I can well empathize with people who worry about um, how Bitcoin is actually stored. Or, you know, what happens if they lose access to it? You know, I could empathize with someone for going through the conceptual mindset um, around how it is that another currency can't be created, which will ultimately surpass Bitcoin. Uh, and, you know, and um, 
why it is that the viral uh, growth effect and adoption effect of Bitcoin is so hard to displace. So a lot of these hostile reactions that we that we discussed earlier, that I raised earlier, I would say the best approach is to empathize with the person who raises those and then help them along their journey in discussing each one of those. Don't make your client feel stupid. People have reasons for the views that they hold and you may think they're stupid, but that's not a good approach either. The best approach I would suggest is that you realize that there are good reasons as to why they think they do. There are good reasons why some people uh, respond to situations of stress with violence. There are good reasons why some people uh, never uh, will never ever again eat mayonnaise. I had a friend who grew up in a boarding school and from a young age, he was forced to eat you know, these sort of disgusting um, mayonnaise spread it over bread. And from that point on, he decided he would never eat mayonnaise again. There are some people who are determined never to drink a drop of alcohol again. And these people have good reasons for those beliefs. They may be irrational, um, but, you know, but don't make them feel that they are stupid because that's probably not going to get you very far. Rather, quite the opposite. Empathize and help them figure out and help yourself understand why they hold these views. That will get the person and yourself on that journey towards a resolution. Encourage self-thought, which enables the client to make conclusions for themselves, as opposed to instructing. So there are a lot of studies have shown that the worst type of parenting you could engage in is authoritarian, where you don't tell children the reasons for why you're asking them to do things. And so you don't say, um, you say, go to bed now because it's eight o'clock. That is not as good as explaining to a child, uh, it's eight o'clock. If you don't go to bed, you'll get tired. If you get tired, you won't feel in a good mood tomorrow morning. If you don't feel in a good mood, you won't be able to do well at school. So, you know, we always need, and then, then the child for themselves will realize why the directions that are being given to them make sense. Okay, so in the scope of, uh, you know, rationale around investing and Bitcoin, what we really need to do is to lay the trail. We need to help a person figure out for themselves why it is that Bitcoin is something which is so valuable if that's what your belief is or what you're trying to persuade them to conclude at the end of their journey. And to do that, you need to lay out the breadcrumbs. You need to help them along with their own thought process. It's far, 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 far more impactful if a person figures something out for themselves as opposed to being forced to follow something or forced to agree with something which they don't underlyingly agree in their own mindset. Be prepared to reiterate concepts and rediscuss the same concept already explained. I, I, I can't tell you how many times, particularly in the area uh, of Bitcoin, but it can be in very many other areas of life. People who have a very hardcore objection may go through a circular cycle, even though they figured it out, they'll still go back to, but, but what if, but what if, but what if? And, you know, when you're a coach, whether it's a tennis coach or a psychological coach, um, it it is a matter of reinforcing the same thing every way slightly differently. And eventually, that really helps. And, and the harder and more ingrained a concept is, the more difficult it is to change. Let's take the concept of agoraphobia, I'm sorry, arachnophobia, people who have an irrational fear of spiders. Okay, they rationally know that there's nothing that is going to happen if a non-poisonous spider, a huge tarantula walks on their hand, but they will be terrified. And there's a process to getting a person to accept that, even though logically they know that they are wrong. Um, the concept that this is not going to hurt them needs to be reiterated and re-emphasized and taught. And it can be done through a long patient process of gradual exposure, um, whereby it is reiterated such that finally a person becomes accustomed to thinking 
in a logical manner as opposed to an illogical manner which actually served them well but is holding them back. Use logic as opposed to emotion. There's no need to become emotional even though the person on the other side is emotional. If, if you're dealing with someone who's upset because they've lost a loved one, as a psychologist, you're dealing with people who are crying and screaming and shouting. And, you know, in, in the Bitcoin um, example, we see a range of emotions, too, from people who are averse to Bitcoin. That doesn't help to shout back or, or to take an emotional stance back. And I see this a lot in online discussions. The best approach is to use a logical approach um, where you actually separate yourself or your, your emotion from the logic that you're trying to explain. And the best way of doing this for both sides is to depersonalize the discussion. It, it doesn't help to call somebody stupid or old or stubborn or, um, or unintelligent um, or to, to, you know, to, to cast aspersions on them. That, that really will just lead to somebody really keeping their guard up and, and being offended. The best thing you can do is keep the discussion objective and not even talk about a particular person. Talk about people. So rather than say to a person, you should be you know, holding some Bitcoin because of X, Y, and Z, talk about a third party. Say to them, here are some reasons why other people would benefit from holding Bitcoin. And again, you, you take the emotion out of it. You make them feel less stupid, less confronted, and you in turn help them take away their own thinking that they apply to themselves and help that apply to others. And once they apply rational thinking to a third party that removes their own personal biases to some extent, and that in turn will help them along the journey.